It's an honor now to introduce our speaker for tonight, Susan Faludi, a well-known public figure and Pulitzer Prize-winning nonfiction author who is also a former reporter for the Wall Street Journal and has published extensively in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Nation, and Harper's, among other publications. And she has written bestsellers that have been groundbreaking challenges to how we understand the complexities of feminism and gender in America today. She's the author of Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, and Stiffed, The Betrayal of the American Man, as well as The Terror Dream, Myth and Misogyny in an Insecure America. Her most recent book, which we are going to be hearing about tonight, In the Dark Room, is a remarkable memoir about her transgendered father, but also a fascinating rumination on the complexities of Jewish identity, sexual and gender identities, and Holocaust and Hungarian history. As she muses in the book, and I'm quoting, I was someone with only the vaguest idea of what it meant to be a Jew who was nevertheless adamant that I was one. My father was someone reminded at every turn that she was a Jew who was nevertheless adamant that her identity lay elsewhere. Tonight's talk in the dark room of identity will, I am sure, open even further these compelling intertwining questions of Jewishness and gendered identity. Please join me in welcoming Susan Faludi. Hi, can you all hear me? Great. Oh, thank you. That, that's my father and me on um, the Chiclo, which was the little, uh, little red uh, incline train that goes up the uh, cliff to Castle Hill in, in the Buddha, on the Buddha side of the Danube. I see some nodding heads. There must be some Hungarians in the room or Hungarian visitors. Um, and you know, Leslie did not mention her Hungarian Jewish connection. I, mean, I, I feel there, we, we are everywhere. Everywhere I go, I'm collecting these incredible stories of um, other people's experiences. Um, so, um, and I just want to thank the Jewish Community Center so much for having this, the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, uh, the University of Minnesota, um, and uh, new friends, and um, some wonderful um, longtime friends, including Professor Elaine Tyler May, who is here somewhere, who has been very generously taking me around despite um, what I fear may be the flu. I hope not. Um, okay, so to begin, and happy International Women's Day. So. <laughs> May it someday be an official holiday here, as it is in many other countries. All right. On the northern end of the Greek island of Lesbos, uh, a dirt path winds up a barren hillside. Near the very top, the treeless landscape erupts in a riot of orange, uh, orange uh, uh, stretching to the horizon, ascending to the sky. This is not a natural orange, the color of marigolds or tangerines. This is the shrieking day glow of caution lights and, Hawaii and highway emergency cones. This is the orange of calamity. Let's see if this button works. Yes. Okay. Uh, this fluorescent midden heap, uh, which is 10 acres wide, 15 feet deep, contains hundreds of thousands of life vests discarded by refugees who have risked everything to make their way to these shores. Some island residents know it as the life jacket graveyard. <coughs> Others call it the mountain of misery. 5,000 kilometers north in the middle of a frozen tundra, another scrap heap. Along a barely passable road in what is known as the Lapland Border Guard District, uh, which is the checkpoint between Russia and Finland, 
Hundreds and hundreds of bicycles are fused into the ice, abandoned by asylum seekers from 30 countries who tried to follow the Arctic route to freedom. Russian law forbids crossing the border on foot, so refugees have to buy a bicycle, but they can only ride them a few yards um, because Finland refuses entry to anyone on a bicycle, <laughs> claiming that um, cycling in winter is dangerous. Um, the graffiti on the Finnish Refugee Reception Center is more honest. It reads, refugees out. And again, an ocean and a continent away in the Sonoran Desert between Mexico and Arizona, one of the hottest, driest stretches in North America, another one. Here lie acres and acres of empty water jugs, backpacks, eyeglasses, dentures, medication vials, rosaries, and prayer cards with pictures of the Virgin of Guadalupe. This dumping ground marks the route where tens of thousands of migrants have risked heat stroke and dehydration, robbery, rape, and murder. Thousands have died along the way. Many more have been turned back by U.S. border guards. If the Trump administration has its way, of course, they will all eventually be thwarted by a beautiful wall. Around the world today are unintentional monuments to the truth that we live in the age of the refugee and the elusiveness of the refuge they seek. By the end of the summer of 2015, 150,000 150, of the refugees who survived a perilous ocean crossing and trudged on foot across the Balkans started arriving in the Central European nation of Hungary. Now, I know a bit about this drama because Hungary, where my late father was from, is a country I've spent a lot of time in in the last many years. In late July of 2015, I was standing on the platform of the Keledi train station in Budapest, waiting to catch a train to Slovakia. Uh, it was a sweltering day, uh, and Keledi was in its usual state of extreme dysfunction, the victim of government austerity. I, I joined this queue of frustrated ticket holders to board a train that was garbage strewn, uh, its bathrooms out of order, its windows stuck shut. Some weeks after I passed through, that same station would explode in mayhem. 3,000 Syrian and other refugees converged on Kelady uh, in early September, seeking passage to Germany. Hungarian police repelled them. The migrants were forced to sleep on the streets and the concrete floor of the station's filthy pedestrian tunnel. The authorities refused basic sanitation, medical aid, food, water. One night, a baby was born in the underpass after an ambulance refused to take the mother to the hospital. The parents named their newborn Sadan, which means shelter. When the Hungarian government announced that it would allow one train to take migrants toward Germany, pandemonium ensued. Thousands surged forward, parents squeezing children through the few open train windows. The people who made it inside considered themselves lucky until the train stopped only 20 miles outside Budapest. The passengers discovered they couldn't get out. The doors were locked. They banged on the windows, pleading for water. Eventually, police in riot gear herded them out of the train and forced them into caged holding pens and then marched them to a detention camp. In all of this, it was hard not to see echoes of the past. As Robert Froelich, the chief rabbi of Hungary, said to reporters a few days later, quote, they tell them the train is going to Austria and then take them to a camp instead? I don't think, he said, the police got instructions from the government to do it this way, but it is very similar to what happened to the Jews in the 1940s. 
Now, when I boarded the train at Kelady Station several weeks before the Syrian refugees got there, it so happened that I was heading to the site of one such 1940s occurrence. I was going to Spiska Podrady, an old Hungarian town under a medieval castle that is now in Slovakia. Jews had arrived there in the mid-19th century after the laws banning them from towns and cities had finally been lifted. They were migrants from the countryside, and they would become essential to the town's fortunes. They became Spiska Podrady's manufacturers, merchants, doctors, lawyers, educators, artisans. Uh, my great-grandfather, Leopold Grunberger, who you see here with my great-grandmother, Sidonia, <laughs> Uh, uh, founded the town's lumber mill, which was its most important enterprise. Um, the train tracks actually terminated in front of his factory. Um, this is a picture of the lumber yard, of my great-grandfather's lumber yard, and um, that's my father in the middle with two cousins. Um, this is in the early 1930s. Um, Leopold became a leading benefactor and devoted civic father. He served on the town council, he headed up the Jewish community, and he, over, he underwrote the building of the town's only synagogue. And you see him here with the town rabbi. Uh, my great-grandfather, like so many of the town's Jews, saw Spiska Podrady as a place of refuge. Until May 28, 1942. On that day, the Spiska Podrady Jews were rounded up with the full cooperation of the town's Christian residents. Um, this photo is actually one of a series that was taken by um, a young Christian man in town who was a friend, uh, who was a classmate of my, one of my um, great uncles, and he later gave these um, pictures to our family. Um, the Jews were hauled through the town square in hay wagons and then loaded on trains to concentration camps. My great-grandfather, as head of the Jewish community um, and as an important, you know, needed for the lumber um, enterprise, um, was forced to oversee the deportation of his fellow Jews. And that's him in the middle there with a the suit and tie and fedora, surrounded by local fascist guards and SS officers. Only 20 of the 416 Jews of Spiska Podrady survived. My great-grandfather Leopold Grunberger died in the concentration camp in Sachsenhausen. My great-grandmother Sidonia in the camp at Ravensbrück. The Christian citizens of Spiska Podrady regarded the Jews as invaders and now were rid of them. They had their refuge too, and it was a refuge from Jews. Today, the rightist Hungarian government and its xenophobic supporters likewise believe they are safeguarding their refuge. I just felt I was being attacked, a Hungarian TV camera woman explained, after she notoriously kicked and tripped fleeing migrants at the border. I had to protect myself, she said. That was how Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has explained the 13-foot razor wire fence that he ordered built along the nation's southern border. A, quote, line of defense, he said, to thwart quote, the Trojan horse of terrorism. And that was the message of government-sponsored billboards erected around the country accusing migrants of, quote, taking away jobs from true Hungarians. Uh, lamentably, Hungarians are not alone in this. The national leader who declared um, last month we, that we, quote, will give every infiltrator two options, a flight out or jail, unquote, uh, was not Viktor Orban of Hungary, it was Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel threatening deportation of African migrants. The flag-waving nationalists believe they are as much in flight from danger as the refugees fleeing a war-ravaged country. 
they see the refugees as invaders, criminals, and themselves as patrolling and protecting their tiny patch of safety. Here is something we ignore at our peril. Refuge is a Janus-faced concept. The original meaning of the word from the Latin refugum is, quote, the act of fleeing backwards. How better to describe Make America Great Again? As much as we live in the age of the refugee, we live in the age of identity. You can't really consider one without the other. In many ways, identity is the modern refuge. It's, you know, our protected haven, our safe space. An identity like refuge can be what we seek or what we guard. Not for nothing do Europe's young fascists guarding their nationalistic turf call themselves gen Generation Identitaire. Identity, like refuge, is a Janus-faced concept. Identity can be liberation, people exploring and standing up for who they are, whether that is an oppressed minority or an unacknowledged social caste or a stigmatized sexual identity. It's no accident that the age of the refugee coincides with the age of gen gender border crossing. We can recognize those seeking new gender and sexual identities as refugees. Or identity can be a lockdown enforced by border walls and immigration raids claimed by nationalistic movements that seek to divide and partition all of us into categories. How do each of us navigate these dangerous waters? Because this is a personal struggle as much as a political one. We each spend our lives seeking refuge in community, work, family, faith. We each spend our lives fearing its loss, recoiling from the terrors of vulnerability, exposure, nakedness to the world's cruelties and chaos. And we each consider the disruptors of our refuge and our identity to be in some way invaders, criminals. My appreciation of this struggle comes from my own personal experience growing up and coming to terms with my father. If ever someone sought refuge and a refuge in identity, it was my father. Born Istvan Friedman, the only child of wealthy Jewish parents in Budapest, he felt keenly from infancy the absence of a secure family circle. My grandparents, uh, uh, Roji and Yeno Friedman, uh, were rather um, elegant socialites. They were rarely home. And they farmed out their son's care uh, to nannies, maids, governesses. Uh, they even missed my father's bar mitzvah. The Friedmans were, in some ways, typical bourgeois Budapest Jews of the interwar era, um, as were many in the assimilated Friedman and Grunberger families. Uh, you can see them here in their finery, uh, which meant that they relentlessly trumpeted their Hungarian identity with everything that they displayed, owned, wore, ate, celebrated. Uh, and they kept their Jewishness carefully under wraps. Then came World War II. Large numbers of my extended family perished in the Holocaust. My father became an urchin on the street, trying to pass as a Christian with only a set of false identity papers and a stolen fascist armband. My grandparents took refuge in one of the so-called protected houses, uh, which by the winter of 1944 were no longer protected. Uh, Hungarian Nazi Arrow Cross thugs periodically would raid them, dragging thousands of their occupants to the Danube and shooting them into the river. My teenage father, armed only with his stolen armband and a rifle without bullets, rescued his parents from the protected house by impersonating and a Hungarian Nazi Aerocross officer. 
My father and my grandparents then survived the rest of the war in a cellar with fake identity papers that my father had obtained that claimed they were Christians from Romania. For my father, this was only the beginning of a cascade of adopted identities. After the war, my father, hoping to blend in, changed the family name to Faludi, an old Hungarian name uh, which means villager. Um, two years later, he fled Hungary and its new communist regime, first to Copenhagen, uh, where he tried to set up an import-export firm distributing Hollywood movies. Uh, and then when his visa expired to Brazil, where he restyled himself as swashbuckling auteur, making films in the Amazon. I had this idea, my father told me later, that I'd be Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, these are adventures I still find miraculous to think about. You know, my father forging a visa and then boarding a repurposed Liberty ship bound for South America. Uh, my father filming and photographing um, uh, in the outback on mule, cheap, uh, open air biplane and seaplane, armed with a movie camera he bought off a German Nazi hiding in Rio. Uh, my father dressed as a pirate during Carnival, his pet parrot named Blondie perched on one shoulder. I wish I had a picture of that to show you. After a military takeover in Brazil, my father decamped once more in the mid-1950s to the United States, where he changed his name to, to Steve, uh, first name, uh, bought a red Ford convertible, and found employment doing photographic work for a series of ad agencies in Manhattan. He spent his days in dark rooms. My father's specialty was altering images. He, he was so good at it that Condé Nast relied on him to do the most highly technical work on the photos they published in Vanity Fair, Vogue, Brides, House and Garden. Um, his clients included the top commercial photographers of the age, Richard Avedon, Francesco Scavullo, Irving Penn, Bert Stern. In, then in 1957, my parents met at a party in Greenwich Village and married after knowing each other only six weeks. They moved to the suburbs, and my father recreated himself once more as an all-American patriarch. Um, and here you see my father barbecuing in our backyard and in his uh, beloved Ford convertible. The driver is me. <laughs> But my father could not shut off his demons. Uh, he ruled our trapped house as the household despot. We feared his wrath and we obeyed his orders. My father's moods turned increasingly dark, explosive, and then physically violent, especially toward my mother. Uh, one day he broke a chair over my mother's back Another time, he threatened her with a knife and a baseball bat. But I was not exempt. Um, one night, after I'd gone with a friend to pay a brief social call on her priest, uh, my father dragged me out of bed and beat my head repeatedly against the floor. My father, who spent so much of his life concealing his Jewishness, was afraid I would convert to Christianity. He later explained his domestic violence as that of a man trying to, quote, defend the family. But I regarded him simply as an invader, unpardonable. I saw him as, as a criminal for attacking my mother. He saw me as a criminal for taking her side. After the divorce, we would barely speak for the next quarter century. During these years, my father went once more in search of refuge. And in 1990, he literally performed the act of fleeing backwards. He moved back to Budapest. 
My father bought a house near his childhood summer villa, uh, and actually a block away. He first tried to buy the villa itself, but it wasn't for sale. Uh, and then sequestered himself inside it. He built a high wall around the perimeter and installed an elaborate security system. Was he intending to protect his property from burglars, which is what he claimed? Or was he also building a fortress to protect himself from all the furies of his own life, and perhaps from his own bad conscience? He had cut himself off from his family, first the one he grew up with, and then the one he had sired. It seemed there was no one to force him to reopen the past. But Hungary's past seemed to be hunting him down. By the mid-2000s, xenophobic Hungarian militias were patrolling the city and countryside, fueling the rise of the far right. And this is uh, an assembly in Hero Square, which is right in you know, the city center. The xenophobes saw themselves as refugees in their own land, cheated and cast adrift. And there was good reason for them to feel that way. The collapse of state socialism's welfare protections and the onrush of free market forces had taken a brutal toll. Poverty and unemployment were skyrocketing. The education system was in tatters. The healthcare system on the brink of bankruptcy. <coughs> Nearly a half million Hungarian citizens left the country in the early 2010s. Hungary had become, as one newspaper headline put it, quote, a country of emigrants. To the xenophobes, though, the problem came from without, from alien invaders, quote, greedy Jews, thieving Roma, and extremist Muslim migrants who were out to destroy the Hungarian way of life. By the late 2000s, men in uniforms adorned with four red on white stripes were marching down Andrashi Boulevard, the, which is you know, the Fifth Avenue of Budapest. Um, the four stripes insignia uh, was a near replica of the 1940s insignia of the Hungarian Nazi arrow cross. These men belonged to the new Magyar Garda, uh, which was the paramilitary wing of the new far-right Jobbik party, a party that was openly advocating throwing Jews out of the country and rounding up Roma in concentration camps. Uh, Right-wing militias rampaged through Roma communities, beat up Jewish worshipers, and desecrated Holocaust memorials uh, in Jewish cemeteries. They described their mission as, quote, the protection of Hungarian tradition and culture. Protecting that culture evidently required a vigilant and virulent sexual chauvinism. Uh, the Jobbik party also tried to push through parliament a bill to make the, quote, promotion of sexual deviations, including, quote, homosexuality, transsexuality, transvestism, and bisexuality punishable by up to eight years in prison. Rightist militias attacked the Budapest Gay Pride Parade uh, with smoke bombs, firecrackers, rocks, acid-filled eggs, rotting food, and excrement, all the while chanting, Buza cat adunabo, zido cat meg utano, which means queers into the Danube, followed by the Jews. In 2010, the rightist Fidesz party championed a vision of the besieged and martyred nation overrun by foreigners uh, and swept into power. The new government quickly pushed through a battery of laws undermining uh, the independence of the judiciary, the media, and a host of government oversight bodies. Uh, they rewrote the constitution, curtailing civil liberties, banning same-sex marriage, and declaring Hungary a, quote, Christian nation. Rightist parliamentary ministers demanded the government draw up a list of Jews who might pose a, quote, security risk to the nation. 
and even called for a renewed investigation into a blood libel accusation against Jewish worshipers, a blood libel case from 1882. When my father first moved back to Hungary in 1990, I had two reactions. The, the first was one I shared with his fellow Jewish expats. How could he possibly go back to Hungary uh, where he had been hunted and where so many of our family members had been murdered? The other was a more private question. Was this another and even more extreme step away from him reckoning with the life he had led and coming to terms with who he really was? My father's act of fleeing backwards didn't seem to bode well for him finding uh, any tranquility in the world or for me finding any connection with him. And yet, when my father died in a Budapest hospital in 2015, we had reached a level of understanding and even closeness. And my father had reached some measure of peace. Both of these resolutions had the quality of what I, I have come to think of as true refuge. <clears throat> the idea of a city of refuge first appeared in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, God instructs Moses to divide the promised land among the 12 tribes of Israel and to designate six Levitical towns as sanctuaries. Um, these towns were to be accessible, approached by double wide roads with well-marked signs and strong bridges. God tells Moses, the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there the cities shall be for you a refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment. This protection, by the way, was not just for Israelites, but, quote, for the stranger and for the sojourner among them. It's important to note that the refugee, no matter where he was from, was seen as a transgressor, a possible criminal. Nevertheless, he would be shielded from avengers until he could be put on trial before an assembly of elders. And if the elders found the killing unintentional or found other extenuating circumstances, he could continue to live in the city of refuge, immune from harm. Though not immune from the duty to reckon with his sins, he was to use the gift of asylum as a continuing trial of self-examination, to interrogate his actions, and no matter how unintentional, to take responsibility for them. That is, the city of refuge was a place not simply of safety, but atonement. In June of 2004, I received an email from my father. By then, we had been estranged for 27 years. The occasion for the note was the news that at the age of 76, my father, without telling anyone in the family, had flown from Budapest to Thailand to have gender reassignment surgery to become a woman. Ishvan, who had become Steve, was now Stephanie. I have decided, my father wrote to me, that I've had enough of impersonating a macho, aggressive man that I've never been inside. My father invited me to come to Hungary and apply my repertorial skills on her life. Write my story, she said. Now, at first, when I learned of my father's gender transformation, I wondered if this was another act of flight my father seeking refuge in yet another identity reinvention. And I arrived in Hungary a self-appointed Levitical assembly of one. <laughs> I was poised to conduct a kind of trial to decide guilt or innocence. And indeed, at first, my father seemed eager to wield her new femininity uh, as evidence that she should be absolved from her past crimes as a man. 
being feminine seemed to be her refuge from atonement. That's ancient history, she would say, each time I brought up her acts of domestic tyranny in my youth. I'm a woman, she said. I'm a totally different person now. When she wasn't denying her past, she was extolling the virtues of 1950s femininity. Mm -hmm. You you can imagine how well that went over with me. At times, this felt like attacks on my own identity as a feminist. Here was my father, whose belligerence and bloody violence sparked my feminism, insisting that, quote unquote, true womanhood was all about being submissive, dressing like Doris Day or Marilyn Monroe, wearing stilettos and boas, and displaying the right accessories. In the spring, she instructed me, you should only carry a white pocketbook. She would sing the praises of traditional wifeliness. Back to the kitchen, she'd announce as she cleared the dishes from from dinner. It's a woman's place. She, She boasted to me that she got a delivery man to haul her Christmas tree all the way up the hill to her house. It's great being a woman, my father said. I look helpless and everyone helps me. It's a racket. Women get away with murder. In case I missed the implicit challenge to my feminism, my father spelled it out. You write about the disadvantages of being a woman, she told me, but I've only found advantages. And yet, that was not the whole story. Over time, my father dropped the show of frilly femininity. She put away the makeup, she cast aside the caricatured personae of vavavoom vamp and dust mopping housefrau. As she settled into herself, she became more comfortable with who she was, a person much more complex and interesting than the cardboard cutout she had originally promoted. Looking back on my father's first phase of ultra girl womanhood, I can see now that in many ways what Stephanie was doing was using the cudgel of hyper femininity to break out of the carapace of a hyper masculine identity that Stephen had been trapped in, an armor that had come close to suffocating my father. And I came to see how she and I were in many respects on a similar life path each struggling to free ourselves from the constraints of gender. In the end, my father's grapple with gender affirmed my bedrock feminist belief that gender is infinitely varied, that we are all all more, much more than the sex roles that society imposes on us. And that our identities are multiple. One doesn't cancel out the other. When the Hungarian LGBT magazine, Mashok, asked my father to describe herself, she replied, Stephanie, a child at Appa. Stephanie, the father of the family. Now, in the early days after her surgery, it sometimes seemed that my father wanted her new gender identity to further erase her Jewishness. Uh, One day at a Jewish music festival in Budapest, After some elderly men stared at her disapprovingly, she kind of nudged me and said, I know what they're thinking. They're looking at me and saying, there's an overdressed shiksa. (laughs) But as time went on, her gender change became something else, a portal to exploring her religious past. She'd start out talking about discrimination against trans women and wind up contemplating a subject she'd always given a wide berth, her youth as a hunted Jewish teenager. Over many years and many visits, my father slowly began to open up, to knock down some of her defended walls. And I began to act less like a prosecutor, more like a witness. Together, we grappled with the burden of the past. My father came around to owning a history she had denied, 
And I came to understand some of the extenuating circumstances behind my father's violent behavior in my youth. The ways that her past actions were not entirely willful, but also a result of a heritage she couldn't control. All of which allowed me, if not to exonerate the domestic violence, then to forgive her. And to see my father not as the caricatured uber patriarch, but as someone struggling with fears and frailties, that is as fully human. I gave up the idea of my father as the intruder in my childhood. And she gave up the idea that my invasive questions about her past were attacks to be repelled. In a funny way, whatever accommodation we reached depended on giving up the idea of refuge as a place to seek or a place to guard. Only when we let each other in and shouldered responsibility for each other's distrust and animosity could we find sanctuary. I've learned something from my personal experience with my father and from the politics I witnessed in Hungary. That identity and refuge are not things to be encircled and patrolled. That the xenophobe who builds fortifications around his identity has already stripped it of the title. That the very idea of refuge demands an intense negotiation between self-inspection and forgiveness, between facing your own history honestly and seeing yourself in the other. It's a place not of safety, but of atonement. True refuge comes from the understanding that there can be no refuge from that reckoning. In 2014, a year before my father died, the two of us visited the Orthodox synagogue where my father had spent every childhood, of, um, every Sabbath of her childhood. For 10 years, I've been trying to convince her to show it to me with no luck. Ancient history, she'd say. But this time, at the age of 86, she agreed. Kaczynski's synagogue is wedged into a corner of a walled-in maze of narrow streets and cobblestone courtyards. It's an enclosed, almost medieval warren uh, that was once a self-sufficient Orthodox community. Inscribed in the frieze on the synagogue's red brick facade is Jacob's cry upon waking from his dream. This is none other than the abode of God, and that is the gateway to heaven. The interior is, in fact, heavenly, a chamber of serenity in porcelain and marble, shafts of blue light piercing the reticulated floral windows. The current congregation is small, shrunk by the Holocaust from 1,000 to 30. My father led the way to the fourth row, the fifth and sixth chairs. These were our seats, she said. She and I sat together, gazing at the marbled enclosure of the ark, the carved emblem above it, two hands held out to deliver the ancient Sabbath benediction. Then she said, I was very upset that time when you went to see the priest. We had never discussed that violent night when she had beaten my head against the floor. She looked down at her hands, resting now in her lap. I shouldn't have been so angry, she said. I reached over and squeezed her wrist. It's OK, I said. Before we left the synagogue, my father turned to me and raised her hands above my head. May God bless you and protect you, she said in Hebrew. May God's face shine toward you and show you favor. May God look favorably upon you and grant you peace. She was reciting the blessing a parent gives to a child on the Sabbath. She was giving me refuge. Thank you very much. Well, Susan, that was a uh, 
um, stunningly beautiful and thoughtful and compelling talk. So maybe um, we have some time for questions. Yes. Yes. So my grandparents, uh, well, right after, so after the war, when the communist government consolidated, they were sent off to the countryside as kulaks. You know, it's because they were, you know, quote, oh, at that point they weren't rich at all, right? Because <laughs> everything had been taken away from them. But they were still because they had had once been wealthy. Um, so and they were sent to live on a pig farm with a whole bunch of other people and one of my uh, my grandmother who was as you can see was quite the um, sort of glamour puss she always looked to me like in the pictures like Joan Crawford um, and the reports from other people in this pig farm was that oh yeah your grandmother would would go into uh, She'd go into the bathroom and close the door, and nobody could use the bathroom for hours. And she'd come out, and she just looked like a million bucks. So, um, but they. Oh no, my no, because my father left for Copenhagen, and then it's um, he came back for a little bit, and then decided he didn't want to stay in Hungary. And um, through uh, my father was a sort of lifelong trickster. He always figured out a way to, so he managed to trick the government into sending him back to Copenhagen, claiming that the film canisters were there, which wasn't actually true. Um, but my grandparents then, so my grandparents were um, uh, applied, you know, for visa. They kept trying to get out of the country, and they eventually went to Israel. Um, so I have a whole you know, wing of my family um, in Tel Aviv, um, in Netanya, um, and, uh, and then another wing in Australia, another wing in Switzerland. So um, part of the, the uh, intense satisfaction of doing this story was, re you know, was connecting. I was going to say reconnecting, but I never knew them because my father wouldn't speak to them. Um, so finding this whole family that I didn't know I had, and um, and they were so warm and welcoming, and so I, you know I feel like I I picked up a whole <laughs> another family on the way. Oh, oh, right. Sorry, <laughs> no. Uh, my father <laughs> uh, at one point went to Israel for three days when. Um, uh, this was after my grandfather had died, and uh, my my father was trying to get the the deeds for the houses that that um, the fam that my grandfather owned in Budapest, because my father's plan was to go back to Budapest and reclaim the property. And my father spent a lot of years trying to claim, you know, reclaim the because my grandfather. Um, in the well, in the privileged years, had bought up a bunch of real estate in in Budapest and basically lived off the proceeds. Of these very beautiful apartment buildings on the Pest side. Um, so that was my father's mission originally, and going one of the missions and going back to Hungary. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to thank you so much for your thanks. Mm -hmm. as kind of feminist as you identify. I just wanted to ask like how you talked about your father's transition and how that kind of formed your ideas related to identity and seeking refuge. But did it ever challenge your feminine ideologies or kind of like I don't know, just like coming up as a feminist and then this happens, it seems like something that would really yes. kind of strike you and yes. right up your alley. So. Well, you know, and I'm I'm pained to say that uh, Early on, um, and, you know, I remember several times in my like in my first couple of visits, I would, and my father would do something. Well, from starting in the very the very beginning of the, when we first re met again, um, 
uh, in the arrivals hall when I got off the plane. And my father was standing there with one of those luggage carts and had taken her pocketbook and hung it on a, like a hook from the luggage cart. And my first reaction was, well, no woman would do that. <laughs> and then I had to think, where did that come from, you know? Like, oh yes, we're born with that gene where you just automatically goes on your... Um, and, you know, I mean, I found myself sort of take, you know, taking it upon myself to instruct my father about, you know, the proper way to, you know, do your hair. Or, um, although I have to say some of that was sort of fun. I mean, it was kind of, you know, it's the fun part of femininity is there's a kind of play to it. I mean, of the, you know, the dress up part of it. Um, so, I, you know, and I had to, so I had to kind of confront that aspect of my own, you know, I, I pride myself on being um, utterly opposed to, you know, sort of essentialist views of gender, and yet I could see myself making, making those um, sort of, you know, snap judgments. Um, so it did, I mean, it caused me to really look closely at what at, at my um, easily Know, lightly held views of you know how enlightened I was. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. My question is this: To what degree can we or should we look to science as well as art, philosophy, and the humanities in the effort to understand identity? Oh well, I think I, you know I don't I well. I don't like separating out anything, including I think science and the arts and humanities and philosophy are, are um, uh, you know, have much to feed each other. Uh, and yes, I think science is certainly part of it. I don't think, you know, I, I do worry when, when um, people approach the gender question by saying, well, we're just gonna, you know, people who believe in the female brain or that there is some, there's, we're going to find some, you know, synapse that will explain all this. I think um, we humans are way more complicated than. So I don't think it's going to end up being a technical answer, but I think certainly there's an interplay of science with, um, you know, science with um, psychology, with you know, early childhood experience combined with prenatal experience combined with, you know your genetic makeup combined with what is happening in the culture and history and society that these, you, you, can't, you can't ever, you know, isolate one what reason why somebody becomes the identity that, that they do, just as identity itself is never one thing. So. Um, actually, Al, I think you had your hand up. Me? No, Al. Oh, okay. What is the role of language in cultural identities? Obviously, certainly mm -hmm. there's a big difference between the Ashkenazi Jews, Jewish temperament, the Israeli, the Hungarian. Yeah. Um, where does the uh, Yiddish come into the picture if you see that as a main token of Jewish identity? Well, you know, it's interesting in Hungary, which is really all I. Um, I think there are probably many Yiddish experts who could answer this question better, so I'm, I'm going to dodge the Yiddish part of it, because um, in Hungary there, was, there wasn't much, I mean Yiddish was not a tradition. Um, and my, of my father's generation, um, the German was, was the first language, and my, my father actually, my father had a German nanny, so that my father's mother tongue, you could say, was German. Um, uh, but language was essential to forming Hungarian identity early on. Um, I mean, it used to be, I mean, Latin was the sort of official language, then German for a long time, and it wasn't really till the second half of the, you know, until the 19th century that, um, and in an attempt to build a Hungarian identity, um, that uh, the, the Hungarian language was um, sort of dusted off and championed and um, 
uh, pushed in the schools. And interestingly, it was Hungarian Jews who were on the forefront of that and who were essential to um, uh, making that connection. And it served, well, so the, in the last half of the 19th century, uh, uh, which is known as kind of, the, it's called the golden age of Hungarian Jewry. Um, and uh, because the, the sort of wealthy, uh, the Christian nobility realized that they, they needed to urbanize the country, they needed to industrialize, they needed, um, you know, sort of to bring Hungary into the modern age. It was one of the last um, to really enter the Industrial Revolution. And um, they didn't have the sort of, you know, burgers of the, this kind of Christian middle class, and they turned, um, uh, they turned to Hungarian Jews of the sort of bourgeois set. Um, and uh, again, language was a key definer. So the the uh, the nobility also need because uh, Hungary was such a melting pot. I mean, it was such a there was such a diversity of of ethnicities that, quote unquote, true Magyars were um, less than 50% and they needed that extra, you know, 5% or so. So they declared that, well, if you, if you, if you wrote down in the census that your, your native tongue was Hungarian, then you, we will consider you a Hungarian. And since, and since a lot of Jews had embraced the Hungarian language, um, that, uh, uh, that was sort of the portal to being finally recognized as fully Hungarian. So language p played a really important role. Um, what, what about your grandmother and how she felt about her son becoming, you know, and then you wrote about the um, American male and the stifling of the American male, the betrayal of the American male. You know, you have Hillary Clinton and you have Chelsea Clinton and Melania in the Me Too movement. Has all of that impacted you too in terms of feminism and you know what you went through in your life? So there's like two questions. <laughs> um, well, to the Three first, questions. yeah, my grandmother, um, my my grandmother had died, and oh. um, and you know, I don't think it's coincidental. My grandmother died. My grandmother <coughs> lived to be quite to be quite old. She died in the um, late 90s, and then my father. Um, you know, uh, transitioned in 2004. And how about your mother? How did that? Um, yeah, my, my parents have been divorced a long time, so um, yeah, so it was not anything my mother, my father certainly didn't consult with my mother. <laughs> right? um, but my, my father did say to me, you know, I asked about, you know, what about your parents, what would they, and my father said, well, they just would, you know, I, it, it, it was very clear that she would never have done this while they were alive. And that, um, my father told me that when she was very young, she, you know, like when she was seven or eight, she would try on my grandmother's clothes and that she had been caught once doing that. So, I mean, it was, and there was a huge amount of, you know, shame around well, it. your father tried on your Yeah. Clothes. Yeah. So your second question, I'm not quite sure well, what the question what is. Well, about the, you know, stifling of the American male, the betrayal of the American male? You wrote a book on that. Too. Right. And Me Too, and all the women now, you know, Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. Chelsea, you know, Melania. And how is all that, and what about the male? How, you know, how that interacts? Well, um, as, as a number of people have pointed out to me, they said, oh, stiffed, the book on, on um, masculinity. Um, seems to be newly relevant, <laughs> and, and you know, I do think that um, what we're seeing in the Trump era is, you know, I was going to say culmination. I hope it's the culmination. I hope there's not another <laughs> chapter of you know a, a historic drama, a gender drama that's been going on for at least twenty years. I mean, when I was writing in the '90s about. Um, you know, the quote-unquote angry white man um, who uh, was, you know, had been in, you know, 
uh, urged on by the right to dump all of their problems on the doorstep of, of minorities, immigrants, and women, and in particular, women embodied by, you know, personified by Hillary Clinton. I can't tell you how many men I interviewed on the right who would just go on and on to me. This was, you know, when she was the first lady. Um, about how well she was really ruling the roost and that she was the power behind the throne and she wants to castrate all men and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, so flash forward to 2016 and we have this, the, the, this kind of uh, condensation of all that with this herb misogynist in Trump who, um, you know, whose prime appeal was, or one of his prime appeals was, you know, putting uh, you know strong women in their place and up against you know the the symbol of you know the uh, uh, perceived by many of his followers as the sort of er feminist Hillary Clinton so you know i think i mean trump during throughout the election when they were <laughs> the media and the pollsters were trying to figure out you know what what was his appeal about um, the the most common denominator among his supporters, more than ideology, education, um, you know, gender, anything, was authoritarianism, that they wanted a strong man. Um, you know, that's a strong man is your advocate, whereas a strong woman is, you know, a wicked witch or a controlling mother. That's sort of the, the two archetypes we have of powerful women. Yes. Do I know. I know. We look at the Italian election, right? That was all about that. I mean, well, maybe Canada. <laughs> we should. <laughs> My father was around. She would be forging her visa there. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I think I keep thinking this is some sort of fever dream that will break. I mean, because it's it's. Um, you know, it's not the problem, um, but I, I don't, yeah, I mean, everywhere, this is, I mean, and it's, you know, it's easy to define, it's comforting to define another and say, that has nothing to do with me, and if we can just get rid of that out there. So we have time for one more question, um, so this side has been ignored. Um, you know, Among in, I mean, I'm assuming older men are afraid of women, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they're insecure. No, we love them. <laughs> anyway, but you, you were describing I, what I would perceive as the voter being an mm -hmm. older man. Mm -hmm. but how about younger? The yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, uh, the younger generation it tends to, uh, male and female tends to be more socially liberal um, more open-minded but on the other hand um, you know young men did not turn out for Hillary Clinton um, and the same you know liberal men young men uh, who had who turned out for Obama um, I, you know, that, I mean among women uh, younger women did, uh, and, and even when you narrow it down to white women, since that was such a charged issue during the campaign, even um, young white women um, and young and college-educated white women, um, a majority of them voted for Hillary Clinton. I mean, just basing it on that. And so, I mean, that tells you that there's, but for the men, I, it wasn't just age. Um, there were more young men who supported Hillary than older men, but it, it was not a majority. So we still have work to go. Yes. Well, they're they're doing good things with the gun gun issue. So cheer them on. In that so I think we can continue the conversation. There's some refreshments in the back and Susan can stay for a little while longer. I'd like you all, again, many thanks, Susan, wonderful. for a wonderful talk.